It is an exciting day because tonight, the Grassbed Homestead presents an evening with Paul Wheaton. I'm putting together all my camera gear for tonight's Paul Wheaton presentation. I'm bringing along the big boy, the DSLR, and I have my normal vlog camera, spare battery for the DSLR, two spare batteries for this guy, extra battery charger, DSLR battery charger, and lots of these little tripod stand things. Some extra memory cards. This right here is a Zoom H6 handy recorder. It's for field audio recording. I have these microphone attachments for it. It gets really high quality audio or I can line directly into it using quarter inch jacks. Freshly charged rechargeable AA batteries for my recorder. Hi little buddy, I love you. I need you to be a good boy for mommy. Yes, I, I might. I don't know if I will. <laughs> you better boy. Well, I'll, be a good boy. well, I'll try. Okay, give me a hug. I love you. Love you too. I'll miss you. I will miss you too. That should be everything. I feel as though I'm forgetting something. I guess that's just because this is such a big event for me. I've never done anything like this before. I've never hosted an event. I'm going into the hotel that we booked for Paul and Jocelyn where they'll be staying tonight. Part of the requirements for getting him to speak was that he got a hotel room because it's an evening presentation. I'm here with Paul Wheaton, the Duke of Permaculture. Thanks for meeting with me, Paul. It's an Thanks honor for having to me. Have you here? I'm just gonna ask Paul a few questions before we head on over to our dinner event here tonight. So, Paul, before we get started, would you mind just uh, letting our viewers should know a little bit about you and the Wheaton Labs? Ooh, me and the Wheaton Labs. I'm bonkers about permaculture, and at the same time, a lot of my philosophies on permaculture are different from the norm. Um, I've got uh, uh, an eco-building design that is a little bit different, the Wafati. Um, I've done a lot with rocket mass heaters. What else, where else am I different from people when I, as a permaculture guy? Um, I think that there are some people in permaculture who are cool with spraying OMRI certified stuff, and I'm not. Um, I, I have some different philosophies on polyculture. I have some uh, different philosophies in use of cardboard and newspaper uh, with uh, horticultural endeavors. I have some different philosophies about composting, like oftentimes I've prefer to not compost. And then Wheaton Labs, I bought this property about three and a half years ago, and uh, I've got some things to try. Some, and, and we've got, I think right now, uh, there's enough stuff there that if a person comes to do the tour, the tour takes three hours if you don't ask any questions. Uh, but a lot of people do, so sometimes it goes six hours. Um, we have a program that's kind of like a woofer program, but it's a little bit more disciplined. And the other thing is, is that if you do it for 18 months, uh, you get an acre for life. Um, we have, we call it the Deep Roots Package. Some people buy a Deep Roots plot uh, outright. And then we've also got the Ant Village, where um, people can come and they kind of uh, rent an acre from year to year. And then some of them are like working towards getting to a point that they uh, are, have deep roots. Uh, so we have quite a community, more than a dozen people up there, um, and we're hoping that this year will be another boom year uh, for, for those projects. Just to swing back around when you were talking about you're different regarding uh, cardboard and newspaper, I've heard you talk about before the adhesives in the cardboard or the um, inks on newspaper, etc. is leaching into the soil essentially, is that... I mean, there's more to it than that. Sure. I mean, it's, it's kind of like, well, what? Look, you know, first, let's look at the newspaper. The newspaper is going to be made out of um, uh, woody bits, right? You're going to get the lignans. I mean, there's actually a process where the newspaper can come out and be perfectly good by my standards for horticultural endeavors. But the thing is, is that they found that there's cheaper ways to mash that wood, and that's going to be using a variety of chemicals. And so you're like, well, what chemicals? And it's like, you got to have a, when you ask that question, you need a date and you need a location because different people that make paper 
will change their recipe for those chemicals like every couple of weeks, depending on stuff and what new stuff is out and whatever. What, and, and then like what they consider to be toxic or non-toxic or what they can get away with in their area, things of that nature. For any given piece of newspaper, it's almost unknown which chemicals they used and how toxic is it. Now there's some of these sites where they make paper, it's now a super fun cleanup site. And it's like, well, why? It's because of this stuff that they use to soften the lignans in the, in the woods to make paper. And, um, and then of course, you know, you go from newspaper to cardboard, then you're gonna glue these pieces of paper together, including the corrugation that's in the cardboard. And it's like, well, what's in that glue? And then so they're always quick to say, well, it's 93% cornstarch. So you could like eat it. Of course, I'm sure it's GMO cornstarch right. and it's probably been heavily, you know, soaked in a, a variety of different pesticides. But then there's like, and what's the last 7%? Once again, changes. And it's like, and how far they'll go is gonna vary from location to location, from cardboard plant to cardboard plant. And again, you can make cardboard that would totally meet my standards, but that's very rare. And, and so when this stuff breaks down, it's, it's seriously toxic. And, and you know, a big part of what I'm trying to accomplish out of Wheaton Labs is that seven years from now, I like the idea of taking somebody, I'm gonna call this Steve, he's my friend, Steve, but poor Steve, Steve has cancer. And I want to take Steve, and and the doctors have given up on him. Steve, you're going to die. Nothing anybody can do. Just get used to it. And I want to bring Steve over to my place and stick him on my place. And mysteriously, his cancer goes away. I, I mean, Steve was told. Steve believed that, and when he was told that he, that he had cancer, he, he believed that there was a cancer fairy that flew through the air and found him and went, ding! You have cancer, and that's where it came from. I have a crazy theory that cancer comes from carcinogens, and not just the carcinogens that we know, but the carcinogens that we don't know. And so I kind of can't help but think that if they're changing the goop that they're putting into the newspaper and cardboard every couple of weeks, and for um, reasons like, oh no, we found out that stuff is really toxic. We're gonna back it off and use this other stuff. And then, oh, we found out that that was really toxic. So we're not gonna use that either. I, I, I am concerned that there's gonna be a lot of toxic gick in that. And then we start using it in our horticultural endeavors that Steve won't, won't have his cancer go away if we feed him food that was grown with that toxic gick. So I want to have something that's so pure that when we feed it to Steve and he's in our very clean environment, which we've been very anal about, far more anal than most permaculture people, then his cancer will just go away. Here, I'm going to put Steve back where I found him over here. Yes. All right. May he rest in peace. <laughs> no, he's good now. All right. He's go, Steve! Very cool interview with Paul Wheaton there. We had to cut it short because I have to head over to the event location to meet with the chef and start getting things set up there. Paul and Jocelyn are going back to their room for just a little bit to uh, get settled in and freshened up. About 30 minutes prior to getting here, Paul had given blood over in Spokane, so he needs to rest a little bit. Here we go. Homestead, and welcome to an evening with Paul Wheaton. Paul? 
Thank you. All right, tonight I'm going to present on, oh, hey, I thought it was up there, I'd get a clue. Uh, replacing irrigation with permaculture. Permaculture structures are sweet and kind and generous and tactful and wise and soft-spoken and considerate. Except for tonight. <laughs> We're going to start off talking about some people that have proven it, or even look at some pictures of it in action. So Sepp Holzer, the mighty, the glorious, the amazing Sepp Holzer, he had a project in Spain. Uh, so apparently there's this woman who is the princess of, I believe, Liechtenstein, and she has something like a million acres. So she brought out 20 experts in reversing desertification, and one of them was Sepp Holzer. He, so the way to hear him tell this story, then it's like the other 19 guys just followed him around and pestered him the whole time. And they kept telling him that everything he was doing was stupid and would never work. So then he gets out to this uh, one patch. So we got two big things. One is, is that this particular property in Spain gets only like six inches of rain per year. He had two big projects. One is he looked around and it was, it was sand dunes. Sand dunes and dying oak trees. But an oak tree doesn't belong in the desert. So Seth came up with the idea that there's a richer store here. And he decided that the lakes that used to be there, he decided there were lakes that used to be there and the other 19 guys are all like, oh, you're so stupid. He decided that they just sunk. They were still there. They were just lower in the ground due to poor land management, that the, the area has been destroyed by, by way too many animals in the system all at once, just eating everything and obliterating all the things. It's, it was in the process of becoming the Sahara and Seth recognizes. So he brought back the lakes, step one, he did it. There's, there's pictures of it, it's, it's amazing, it's beautiful, it's stunning. Um, but on top of that, another project he does, he had two acres that he tried to turn into like a garden of all your favorite garden plants. And then these 19 characters were there and they said, it'll never work. And so they insisted that he had to have some kind of irrigation. So he says, tell you what, I'll irrigate half of it. So he put a drip irrigation on half of it. And it turns out that for the first year, both halves did about the same. They both grew a bunch of plants, and you know there, you couldn't really tell the difference between the two. Then they shut off the irrigation on the second half, and everything there died. So the moral of the story is, is that you got to kind of put your plants through a little bit of boot camp, and then they'll do great. That's kind of what plants are designed to do. And then um, if you don't put them through that little bit of boot camp and you take away their candy, then um, they're going to throw a fit and die. Oh, really? What an evening. It's probably about 10 o'clock right now. I just walked Paul Wheaton and Jocelyn to the car to help him carry out some stuff. Paul was pretty exhausted. I tried to get a little bit more out of him for the interview and he was pretty pooped. I'm just fried. Um, in fact, can you help us haul this out to the car? Absolutely. 